All right, so thanks for coming to my presentation today. Uh, my name is Christian Schuster. I'm a solution architect at CERN. I also work as a staff software engineer there. And I wanted to talk to you a bit about handling 100K plus visitors at the world's largest physics lab. CERN, in parentheses, in case uh, some of you might not know. Um, now, who am I? Uh, I've been around CERN for around six and a half years. You might say I work in construction, given the hat and so on, but uh, no, I actually work in software engineering as well. And uh, I also guide people at CERN, so if you ever pass by by any chance, feel free to hit me up. We might organize a guided tour. If the accelerator is off, we might go and see something together and so on. Uh, I've been working in various environments, uh, computer security, the SSO team, and recently I started working with uh, a business computing group, as we call it, so building all sorts of useful tools for different business use cases at CERN for internal clients. <clears throat> now, people think that at CERN we do something like that, more or less, right? So we're opening black holes, uh, we're creating portals to alternate universes and so on. Every time there's some new fancy announcement of uh, something going on at CERN, people kind of lose their minds and start commenting some very interesting things. But uh, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. So actually what we do is split into four different categories, let's say. We'll get to the tech part of it as well. I just wanted to give you a bit of an introduction. So we do discovery through science. We also do technological innovation on various levels, including engineering, uh, cryogenics, electronics, and so on. Diversity and bringing nations together is one of the missions of CERN as well, and inspiration and education. Okay, And that's the part that will be touching a bit on in a second. So what we actually do is more like this. We smash protons at very, very high speeds, close to 99.9999, many nines percent of the speed of light. In the middle of these huge detectors, we have four of them on a 27 kilometer tunnel. I don't know how much that is in miles. I'm sorry for that. And uh, we analyze the data in order to understand the origins of the universe and so on and so forth. To make an analogy, uh, I went to a nice uh, baseball match yesterday and uh, imagine the batter hitting the ball, right? So it's kind of like that. It's just uh, he hits it and it goes up to 99% of the speed of light and then it ends up, it ends up uh, spinning around even more and you keep hitting it to, to conserve the energy, okay? So now, talking about inspiration and education, um, because we're talking about visitors, right? And this is our business use case in here. We have a new exhibition center, a new uh, museum, let's call it, but it's not just a museum. There are labs, there are interactive things to do as well there, called the Science Gateway. You can access it. We have a top-level domain, sciencegateway.cern. You can read about it, how it was built, and so on. Um, people seem to like it, and people seem to like it a lot, right? In the sense that people keep coming, and uh, that was in February this year, so we announced our 100,000th visitor uh, close to five months after opening. So we get a lot of people coming over, which means we get a lot of requests for people to go on guided tours and visits and so on, right? Um, and one of the big problems that we have here is the fact that we need to focus a bit on global versus local visitors. What I'm trying to say is that CERN is funded by the member states of CERN. And uh, well, the US is an associate member state, which uh, has a smaller status, but still, the point is we have most of the European states, uh, Israel, the US, and so on, which are member states. And what we do, we receive some sort of uh, well, donation for research for them every year, which means whenever we do outreach activities, they need to reach a high amount of people and kind of distributed equally. We're exactly on the border between France and Switzerland, we'll actually cut in half by the, by the border, right? Um, which means that if we leave it open for people to just come and visit us, what will happen? Well, people from France and people from Switzerland will be most of the people that will actually come visit CERN, right? And then if there's a school group from Greece, from Turkey, from anywhere else, then they might not actually get the chance of visiting CERN, which is a problem, let's say, for our general outreach activities, right? And um, there's also a lot of manual work, right? So you get people asking, hey, I want to visit CERN. Can I visit CERN, please? You get 
hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of these requests, right, every year. And the visit service came and they were like, okay, look, so we want to allow groups to book visits at CERN in the next nine months or so, right? Uh, and to minimize the number of rejections that we have to do because of certain quotas that we have and so on. So basically, we want to have maximum X groups of some people coming per week. Uh, the guide, the tours might be in different languages as well, right? So, so you might have like uh, French, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, depending on uh, what group comes, right? If there's school children like eight years old, right? You can't expect them to speak anything else. So you want to find a guide at CERN that actually speaks the language of the group. Uh, and then we have weekly quotas, daily quotas, uh, the number of children, don't allow holidays because we're on holiday and we don't do guided tours then, don't allow Mondays because it's closed like a museum and so on and so forth, right? And all these rules, they change most of the time quite fast, right? So people from the visit service, they come and they're like, look, we need to change this, we need to extend it, and in the future we might add some different rules you see where we're going, right? And it's kind of lots of code, potentially hard to refactor, hard to actually change on, in, in real time, right? And then you look at this beautiful table, right? Which basically says, okay, we have guided tours, but we also have lab workshops, and all these slots, PMS, basically means a different age category. On this certain day, we're going to have two slots. A slot basically means 24 visitors, right? Now, trying to encode this into conventional programming uh, is difficult, one might say, especially because errors might appear and because you might end up in the situation where you have to change it. So if somebody implemented it a bit like uh, ad hoc, let's call it, then uh, it might be really hard to do these changes in the system, right? And the user interface, we want it to be as simple as possible. So people come, they're like, okay, um, I'm going to provide my group profile. I'm coming with a school of 12 students, two accompanying adults from Estonia. They speak English, and uh, they're between 13 and 16, and uh, they're going to come with their own bus, right? Because we don't have a lot of buses to actually provide to people to ship them around. Given the fact that we have multiple sites, it takes them time to go from one point A to point B, right? And the moment you input all this data into the system and you select your preferences, right, so here it selected lab, workshop, and guided tour, you're going to get a nice calendar, like a booking system, right, of uh, possibilities, of things that you might want to, to do. And then the moment you actually click, okay, I want to book this thing, then the system blocks it for you. And you get contacted, and nine months later, because usually that's how it happens, we, we block everything for nine months, and then, uh, the moment it's like a day later, you can book for nine months in the future. It takes a lot of time to, to actually visit CERN, unfortunately, because there are so many requests, right? So you have some options, right? One of the options is to just pre-compute everything. So you take all the requests which you confirmed and all the requests which are pending, so the ones that were not like actually approved or not by the visit service, and you build a huge table with all the permutations, right? So all the languages, all the countries, how many slots, let's call them, are blocked by these uh, people, right? Well, what's the caveat here? Well, the fact that we can't pre-compute, well, we need to pre-compute everything, but the problem is when a new request comes in, then you need to make sure that it goes in and blocks the system the moment when it comes in so that the future visitor might not get, try to get the same slot, because then they're going to get rejected, right? So it's a bit of a race condition here. Um, and we can't really have eventual consistency. It would be nice to just throw everything into a, a you know, Kafka or something, and then wait for the message to come in. Uh, well, not really, because people might be accessing it exactly at the same time, so then it's not great. Um, there's another option. So we can compute possibilities on the fly, but... Like I said, the rules change fast. Um, they're quite complex sometimes, so maybe it's not the most computationally efficient to do that, right? Because then uh, you apply all the rules to all these things, combining them with the input that comes from the quota system, and, well, then you give an, a yes-no answer, basically, and uh, you say which dates. Think about the fact that you also need to provide nine months of information, because you can book from any moment from today to nine months in the future. So we need to tell you the availabilities for all those dates, right? Well, there are some alternative techniques. 
Uh, it's a bit of an enterprise uh, solution way of thinking about it, but you can think of providing your rules as a declarative thing, right? So you don't focus on the how, you don't focus on, you know, how to bake a cake by adding flour, eggs, etc., etc., etc. You focus on what? So you describe exactly what kind of cake you want to develop in this situation. There's something which actually executes all these rules, and then you profit from the rules execution, right? So, so you don't really uh, you don't really get into the complex situation of needing to hard code by hand each and every one of these uh, rules. And then we looked a bit around. We talked to the solution architects in the group. We were discussing, OK, maybe there's some technology that might help us in this uh, particular approach. And this is the option that we went for, declaring what you want, right? And uh, there's a nice little project from Red Hat called Rules, uh, which allows you to compute things in a rule-based system, right? The algorithm itself and so on. You can. Uh, Google it, but I'll just go a bit over how it works in our implementation, right? So you get the user inputs, the ones that you saw in the user interface there, and you have a bunch of tags for different scenarios, right? So if you want to do guided tours, you have some facts. We're coming with a bus, we're from that country, and so on and so forth. And for the labs, it's more like we are of a certain age range, which means we might occupy one or two or three slots in the schedule of a certain day, right? What are those days that can I get out of it, right? And the quota system does the churning bit, and it spits out the availability, OK? And you'll see in a second, but it's quite fast, given the amount of inputs that we're giving it, right? So the idea is that we do all this computation on the fly the moment you ask for it and the moment you actually confirm, because somebody might have done something in the middle to book their visit at CERN which means, uh, well, that slot is not available anymore, so we're like, ah, sorry, but somebody else uh, did it for you, right? And uh, to see how it looks like, I'm going to walk you through MVEL, the beautiful language that you use to write rules, rules right? So, so basically, this is a rule which says that any country, like any visitors from a certain country, we want to have at most 200 visitors from that country per day, right? And green means, OK, yes, uh, please come. So you can see that you have some outputs that are living in your universe of facts, the Q guy over here. And then you have the visit request input. So basically, this is all the input that comes from the user interface that you saw before. Plus, you have all these uh, calendar information. So basically, it's like, do I have a an input of that country on that date where the number of visitors is uh, between uh, this, then modify the output and put in the fact that you know, the country rules have passed. Right? So you take the rule set, you, ha you have your universe of objects, you mash them together, and then you tell the engine, run. Okay? And run until you're done running all the rules. So fire all the rules in no specific order, which is great for us. Uh, why? Because we can just add another rule in the future and then it doesn't complicate our lives in any particular way as long as we don't do any kind of crazy looping and so on. If the rule is like, okay, execute and do your stuff like that, then it's fine, right? So we say that the country rules have passed, okay? But we have other sets of rules that execute more or less at the same time as far as we're concerned. And... Uh, it's quite efficient in the sense that we pass in around 9,200 data objects inside the thing, and it takes some milliseconds for it to be able to sum up all of that. Um, and as I was saying, we have multiple of these, right? Uh, so we have uh, visit tiles, we have uh, language categories, we have whether you're coming by bus or not, which is counted towards the quota system and so on. And at the end of all this, uh, Turning, if all of them are actually matched, then you say that, okay, we actually have a guided tour available for that date, and we set it into the quota output. You don't see it here, but the quota output object also has an important uh, thing there, the date and the time slot, which is either in the morning or in the afternoon, right? So you could go outside of the morning or the afternoon. And what you see there in the bottom uh, right 
you see that it says, okay, guided tour available at 2. That's the date on the morning time slot. And that gets translated into something that you can uh, implement. If you ask for more than the guided tour, if you want to elaborate what they want, of course, you can't do it at the same time. You can only do it in the morning or in the afternoon. So you get all the permutations possible, including the days before and, uh, and after. Right? Um, yeah, let, let me show you how it works a bit. Uh, I have a nice little test environment set up here. Uh, my uh, Linux machine. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, this is what you see. You come here and you fill in uh, some information. Okay, you're coming from uh, at uh, let's see, come to the United Kingdom. United Kingdom. Uh, English, right, and we're a group of, I don't know, middle school students, we're coming with our own bus, and so on and so forth, right? And then we're saying, okay, so which activities do you want to do? Do you, do you want to go for an exhibition? The exhibition has high availability in the sense that you don't need a guide, right? You just come in, you, you visit the thing, and that's it. But you also have lab workshops, you have uh, guided tours, right? Let's say we only want a guided tour for now to keep things simple. And this is a dev environment. Let's say we have the availability for tomorrow. Normally, at least you would, right? So you can see that, okay, like uh, we have the 12th of September in the morning or in the afternoon that we can select that we want to fly, right? And this is the week of the 12th, right? Let's say we're taking that, okay? Um, or even better, let's go and uh, change things a bit. So this is running on my local machine, so it's not any kind of like significant way of comparing how fast this go but in terms of uh, in terms of the cost let's see it should be taking taking my local machine right now um, never mind now I selected that I want a lab workshop as well so let's see what the quota system spits out so it says look uh, we have on the 31st in the morning and the afternoon you can do this or uh, there are more options which span two days and then you have multiple combinations possible and we tend to prefer the one which goes for the tour first and then the workshop because there's some uh, creative uh, hiding of options in there. Okay, but to keep things simple, let's block a slot for September. Let's put more people in the group. Let's say we're um, 46 students. Yeah. It's free, by the way. You don't need to pay anything. To um, all right. And then I request my visit. Oh, no. Uh, Postal code from the United Kingdom. Oh, no. I, I just protect myself with, uh, with my own tool. Um, oof. I don't know any postal code. OK, UK postal codes. <laughs> Let's go. Let's find one. Mm. Thank you, Wikipedia. The numbers, PH, my God. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the, the uh, and then, uh, no, no. Hi. Let's go. Find me. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. All right, so. What did I copy? I copied SC17PB. SC17PB. Oh, by the way, this is using the OpenStreetMap API. Uh, there's a very nice uh, like postal code to uh, to street address uh, thing, uh, just to see that it's the same country that you're actually requesting. It's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm requesting. It created some stuff in the system. Okay, so we'll evaluate the thing and decide within five business days. But I don't care. The thing is that it should actually be blocked now, right? So, the, so the moment that I um, I try to oh, let me go there. And okay, so you remember it was the third of uh, the third of September, right? So if I did everything correctly, um, 
46 or 56, I don't know, 46, yeah, to United Kingdom. So another group is coming now. Uh, kingdom, yes, English. They're the same age range, just to keep things simple. And we're coming with our own bus. Want to go on a guided tour? I think we have uh, more slots available than I thought for uh, for the United Kingdom. Um, but that's fine. We're going from another country, right? And we should see, in principle, we should see a different availability. Well, we can still come on the 3rd of September. That was a bad example. I'm sorry for that. But I promise you it works. Uh, it has been thoroughly tested by our very talented team of engineers. All right. Now, um, getting back to the presentation. Uh, we did a bit of performance testing, like actual performance testing, uh, using Gatling. I don't know if you heard about Gatling. It's a very nice open source uh, tool for load testing and so on. Um, this, these results are somewhere in a paper that we published together with my colleagues uh, a while ago in December, December last year, yeah. Um, so as you can see in most of the cases, this is not a very beefy Kubernetes container or anything like that. We, we didn't throw a lot of resources at it because realistically there's not going to be that many people which actually want to visit at the same time, right? So when we get to like 50 users per second, then it gets a bit to the two, three second mark. But even then, uh, you've seen lots of websites which do that uh, on a daily basis. So it's not that critical. Um, if you want to read more, there's a link. Uh, I put the presentation in Pretox, so you can download it from there. But uh, basically, the title is Optimizing Visit Booking at CERN and uh, a rules-based approach. Right? So, so you, can, uh, you can have a read there if you're curious more about it. Talking uh, about open source technology like rules, uh, most of the software that we're building at CERN is based on open source technology, right? So, so we're, we're using Alma Linux as the, the, base, uh, the base Linux distribution for most of our things. We do have uh, RHEL in some things, but not everywhere. In our group in particular, we use Alma because it's, uh, it's the way the infrastructure team prefers us to go. Um, we use Argo for continuous deployment and so on, React in the front end, Kubernetes obviously because we're using Argo, and Spring Boot right, as the API backend. Talking about giants, uh, I'm not working alone on this thing, so uh, I, you didn't follow the Euro Cup. This means nothing to you probably. But uh, all these guys are, uh, are basically uh, the awesome people that I've been working with in the team, so I want to give them a shout out as well because it's not... Uh, an individual contribution this. And uh, Time recently published their list of world's greatest places to visit in 2024. And the CERN Science Gateway is among one of those places. There's a nice link over there if you want to read about it. I uh, would encourage you to visit .cern, right? So it's quite simple. You, 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 can, uh, you, can, uh, you can remember that there's this uh, link over there. If, uh, if you want to go through the process, if you have any feedback, if you have any uh, issues with the whole thing, feel free to reach out to me, to well, any of my colleagues. But you can reach out to me if you have any issues with the tool, uh, and we can, uh, we can iron them out. We're running a bit short, but uh, if you want to ask any questions, we can uh, do that. Meanwhile want to connect on any kind of social media. I, uh, that fake uh, looking uh, Reddit name is because it's like uh, the X name is automatically generated. I don't use Twitter, so don't, uh, it's, it's just there. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's, uh, yeah, it's a bit shorter than expected, but uh, that leaves you time for questions. Otherwise, uh, I really appreciate being here and thank you so much. Any questions? Yep. So the question was, what was the learning curve for learning something like drools and embedding it into the, the software? 
Um, so we actually started with, uh, let's say, proof of concept project first, where we uh, played a bit around with drools. The thing is, we, we already had some people using drools for, different, uh, for a different purpose inside the group. So they were doing some uh, uh, rule-based authorization using uh, some more complicated drools. So they were using drools there already. And we used their expertise a bit to kind of bootstrap the project. Um, what I can tell you is one of the big, let's say, issues that we still have with it is when it works, it's amazing, but given the fact that the rules, they execute in no specific order due to this uh, RETA algorithm, right? It's hard to debug, right? So if you have issues, it's really hard to debug. At some point, we ended up building a kind of dashboard which showed you all the inputs that go into the system so that we could like, you know, go over with the pen and see, ah, look, because there are 46 people on this certain date, uh, that slot is blocked or like the whole week is blocked now because adding all the people aggregated over a week is, uh, is way over the limit or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, but it's a good point. It's, uh, it's something that you should take into consideration. It comes with the hidden cost of uh, issues with debugging, but you can unit test it quite nicely, actually. So, and we have plenty of tests for all the rules that we, we develop. Thanks. All right, well, Thank you very much then again and uh, wish you a nice day.